initially my initial thing is like ego of like, well, why don't you get up there and do it? Now I understand the, the deeper level. They know that I know more than I presented. What they don't know is nobody else necessarily in the room was ready for me to teach certain things. Value is contextual. Value is dependent on where somebody is in their journey. And if you tell a story that somebody remembers, oftentimes that's more important than a lesson that they forget. I think it's always more important. So to your point, it's different audiences require different delivery. And it's going to be like that forever. We speak in schools. It's hard because I have to think like, okay, what do you, what do you even want to know? You might not even want to hear what I say. So I have to connect with you on another level, most likely. And it's just, it's very humbling. What story are you telling? Whether you're intentional about it or not, you have an audience and they think in story. The Doug Thompson podcast features diverse storytellers sharing their practical tips for telling the story they need others to envision and trust in order to take a new action. Here's your host, Doug Thompson. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Doug Thompson Podcast. I have with me this week another podcast host, Mr. Kevin Palmieri. How are you doing, Kevin? Doug, I'm living the dream. I'm grateful. Uh, I know we, I think we rescheduled this and the power tried to to shut this off for us, but we're going to power through and uh, I'm excited, my friend. Looking forward to it. Yeah, well, the power just said, hey, you can't start early. I think that's what it was all going on. So had a little power flash, you know, a little technology thing, but anyway, we're all back up and running the record buttons are going and you know back in the day i could see the reels turning but i go i date myself back when i was doing a little radio so okay. anyway so kevin how what do you do when you're not being patient with another podcast host honestly that's kind of all i do doug i'm i'm a full-time podcaster a speaker a coach and an entrepreneur i'm very blessed uh, we have 940 something episodes and i get to do this every single day. So that is my main thing. I spend more time in front of this microphone than I do probably anywhere else. So this is very in alignment with what every other day looks like for me. Well, that is excellent. Then I, I do this as a side thing on 900 episodes. That's what have you learned over the 900 episode? If you compared to episode one to episode like 450 and then 900, what would it be like? Oh, um, so we actually... <laughs> I think for episode 500, we went back and listened to the first episode and it was very, very challenging. I will tell you that. I would say that you have to understand that the reps, so the repetition of you performing, Mm -hmm. it really starts to multiply. It starts to get exponential eventually. I mean, one to 450, there was definitely a difference. Not as much as I would have liked to hope, honestly, but 450 to 900, it's, it's a completely different thing. And we went from making very little money to making more money. And we went from having very little clients to having clients all over the world. So I would just say the opportunity is the biggest thing that jumps off the page. If we quit a hundred episodes in, we would have never saw 450. If we quit 450 in, we wouldn't be where we are today. I would say that just the evolution of you as a human, how much you can shift in a couple of years, really. Yeah, I, I can tell, you know, with mine, I'm, I'm approaching a hundred. If you combine the business podcast that we started this year in, and this one, and, and it, there's a lot of difference. There's a lot of growth. You learn, sort of learn, you learn your voice for one thing. It was an interesting thing. I went to uh, get fitted for hearing aids the other day. One, they don't work with headsets, so I can't wear them when I'm doing the podcast. <laughs> but she said, you know, is, you'll probably be confused because you'll hear your voice. I said, no, you don't understand. I hear my voice all the time. So I'm, you know, that's spot on. I kind of like, I kind of like that. It makes me feel like I'm doing a podcast all the time. Yeah. But what would you podcasting do? Podcasting your head. Yeah. What did you do before you did podcasting? Before I did this, I was actually in weatherization. So think of uh, my job was to go into state and government owned buildings and make them more energy efficient. And I had a really good amount of money coming my way because we worked contracts. So I was working for the state. So we were getting paid really well, but I just didn't enjoy it. It, it was something that I did purely for the money hundred percent for the money. There was no passion behind what I was doing. And after I made six figures at 26 with no college degree, something shifted in me. I said, this isn't what I want to do forever. And the first podcast I was ever a part of, I was actually interviewed as a guest. And after the interview, 
I sat down with two of my friends and one went to the bathroom and the other one and I were sitting, we were sitting in the living room. And I said, imagine if you could do that for a living, like that hour and a half went by so fast. Imagine if you could do that for a living. And he said, you know, you can, right. And then I went and bought all the equipment and figured out how to audio edit and all that. And as they say, the rest is, is history, but that was really just the beginning of the journey. But yeah, I was, Doug, I did construction. I worked housekeeping at a hospital. I was a personal trainer. I was a truck driver. I was many, many different things. I never knew what I wanted to do with my life, but I was always pretty quick to figure out what I didn't want to do. And then I would leave and go to the next thing. Yeah. I've had some of those, I know what I don't want to do jobs. Um, I did. I've definitely had that in the, yeah, I was a pot. I think all of us started out as a guest on a podcast at some point in time and, and you sort of got the vibe for being behind it. I, as I mentioned, I, I'd, I'd forgotten about it a little bit. There's sort of a phase of life that you, you don't, if you, unless you reflect, you don't realize sort of you, there was early warning signs that tell you what you should be doing. You know, you can look back. Um, like I said, I, I did the sports morning sports for a radio station is just a part time. I won a contest. I ended up doing that for a couple of years and I enjoyed it. But the life of a, a radio DJ back in the day was, you know, you're kind of transient and it's, you know, it, you, you had to pay a lot of dues to get, to get up there. And I said, you know, that's not, that's not for me. Um, but you know, later I, I picked it up when I started this, this reminds me back. I was talking to a mentor of mine, uh, on an episode of his podcast and he was, he was a big radio guy. He was a program director. He was a writer and stuff for the morning zoo back in the day, back when, before Howard Stern went uh, to uh, Sirius. That uh, you know is that's what it was. So anyway, I, that revi- that sort of reminded me of that. But when when did you? So what was the little voice inside? I mean, if you look back now, can you see some things that this is sort of what you'd want to do? Yeah, I, it's it's awesome that you're in the same boat and you can ask that question so authentically and from experience. I used to drive a truck, and when I drove, I would listen to in the area. It's called the Hillman Morning Show. It is the most popular morning show in the Boston, New England area. I used to listen to that and think to myself, okay, I'm getting in this truck and they're starting their day. Yeah. When I get back to the shop to fill my truck up, they're done. And I'm just going back out again and again and again. (laughs) How awesome would it be to sit in front of a microphone for four hours a day? Now, little did I know that they got there early and they stayed after. I didn't realize that was part of the gig, but that was a huge thing for me that the fact that you could use your voice and just kind of have conversations is something that looking back, it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I never, I never thought that before, but then I remember I started listening to Joe Rogan and it was, imagine if you could have deep conversations with people for a living. So looking back, it makes a lot of sense, but in the moment, like you said, you, you can't really tell. Yeah. It's, it's something that sort of is latent. It, it sort of floats around in the back of your head. And, you know, I'm right. Luckily I, in my, in my job as a, as a sales nerd, I get to talk to people. And not necessarily behind a microphone, but I get to talk to people about the problem. And so I, I'm exercising that muscle, even though it may not be behind a microphone to, to do that. But it, it does sort of, you think about how many, I have, I have people weekly or you know, monthly or weekly email me something, hey, this episode that you did sort of touched home and, and meant something to me, right? You've impacted that. And I'm sure with that many episodes, you've had that thousands of times, but it never ceases to sort of, again, reinforce that we're put here for bigger things than a lot of us ever dare to try. Mm. One of the most common things that people say is how did you do 900 episodes? And I always say, it's not about me. It just isn't. And I know that sounds cliche and it probably sounds, you know, but I, I feel so blessed and so grateful that I get to do this. There's people out there listening to our show right now, as I'm doing this. And it's just, when you, when you get, the opportunity to quote unquote, live your dreams, you have to take that. You have to stay responsible. Like that is a a great thing to do, but you have to do it responsibly and you have to take it seriously. And I just, I realize how blessed I am. There's a, there's a weatherization company that is literally right down the street from where we live. And some days in the morning on the way back from the gym, I'll see them packing up their trucks and leaving. And I always, that's that reminder of, "Mm, yeah. Yep, you could be driving somewhere right now. Don't, <laughs> don't take this for granted. And I'm human. Yeah. I, I do. I think everybody does, but it's a, it's a good reminder. It's a gentle reminder to, to focus on what you should be doing. Yeah. I, th- I think we all need that course correction on occasion. I, I rely on my wife to do that quite often. Sometimes I'd 
forget that she's doing it because she loves me. So, <laughs> but <laughs> been married for 40 years, you know, that I need that reminder a lot. What are some of the, so obviously you've connected with your story and you have the ability to help other people tell their story and connect with their story. Is that, was that something you sort of just sort of naturally drew to? Did you, you know, study or like listen to Joe Rogan's a good way. Cause he, he really can have a really good conversation. If you can talk to anybody for three hours, that's, there's a skill there in being able to listen to some things. Yeah. Even going back to your previous point in, I think it was 2012, Facebook lives were not a thing. Nobody, it wasn't existent on the platform yet. I don't think, but I remember I sat down and I did a video on my cell phone that I posted to Facebook and it was, do you deserve to be happy? And in this video, I basically talked about how we all think we deserve certain things and we do deserve some of these things, but I believe you deserve what you work for. If you work for happiness in life, I think that you deserve that. And I think back then I just felt good about sharing messages. The biggest thing for me, Doug, was getting over the fear of judgment. That's, that was the biggest thing with this whole, this whole thing. And I think it is that way for a lot of people, especially with social media, but I never, I didn't go to college. So I never had given presentations for the podcast was the first time I ever talked to a group of humans really other than middle school and high school. So no, I, I never knew this was something I wanted to do. I never anticipated being a, a decent speaker. I never saw myself being an educator or presenter. That was that, yeah, that was not in the cards for me. I think it just worked out that way. Yeah. It's you're, you're sort of, you sound a lot like me in that you, you naturally curious about certain things and you pick up things that other people wouldn't necessarily see. You're more attuned to, hey, that would make a good story, or this person here would make a good guest, or, or something like that, because you can hear something. You get, you know, I'd ask you sort of something. You'd listen to a couple of the episodes, and you pulled out the, of those episodes exactly what I'd hoped to. So, you know, it, it was it was it was a good experience to know that. So, how do you it, oh, across 900? I'm sure that you've had some guests that you've had to assist more than others. And <laughs> how do you how do you go about doing that? <laughs> It's interesting. I, I think of it, I think of that very similar to the way I think of an audience when I'm speaking is everybody's at a different frequency and or a different capability. So if I go on stage and I tell a story that has a point and it has a lesson and it has a hook and it has a future pace, it has everything a good story has, you might walk away thinking one thing and feeling one thing. But if I go on stage and try to teach you something, of like, these are the five fundamentals of everything you need to know. You're going to leave that saying, I have no idea what we're talking about. I think that the guest situation is very similar. I go in with an understanding of, okay, this person's specialty is whatever. Maybe it's copywriting, maybe it's writing, maybe it's speaking. And then I go in with that understanding of there's only a certain depth that this person can probably go. It's my job to get them there and then try to keep pulling the string at that depth, depending on, on what we're talking about. But I think number one, it's experience. And then number two, expectations. If you can have the correct expectations going in, and you said it in the beginning, you said, well, I'm talking to a podcaster, so I know we'll probably be just fine. Oftentimes we're not talking to podcasters. We've had people on who have never been on podcasts and it's been very interesting, but I think it's, don't be afraid to, to start digging the hole and just dig it very slowly, very slowly. Because if you dig too fast at once, you can hit a pipe. And if you hit that <laughs> pipe, that interview can go off the rails. Yeah. Sounds like it sounds like back from your insulation days. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hit many a pipe. And you're right. I, I was editing a podcast that I'd done for work uh, from one of our pro product managers. And this was the first podcast she had done. I'd heard her speak on other things and all these other things. So, so it was, it, it, you, you sort of, you turn up the temperature a little bit, turn it down. You, you try to, you know, again, try to get them to the point where they're their best. My I always tell them my job is to make you look good. You know, I have the, I have the easy part and, and it's sort of listening to that. And then also you, you mentioned a certain depth preventing them from going down and losing people because they start doing what I call text planning, which, you know, in, in the technology industry, it's sometimes it's easy, too easy to do. You acronyms get thrown around and these other things you have to remember and everybody's listening especially those people with a budget to buy things anymore, don't necessarily know all that stuff. They just want yeah. something to fix their problem. Yeah, I think it's just 
any form of speaking, communicating, influence is about knowing your audience. I had somebody recently, and this is this is a great story. This is a great analogy. We did an event. There was, I think it was like 60 people in the audience. We had a hotel venue, beautiful. It was awesome. And I got feedback from a couple people through the grapevine after my speech. And they said, I was just a little bit disappointed that Kevin didn't teach more. And initially my initial thing is like ego of like, yeah. well, why don't you get up there and do it? But <laughs> now I understand the, the deeper level. They know that I know more than I presented. What they don't know is nobody else necessarily in the room was ready for me to teach certain things. Value is contextual. Value is dependent on where somebody is in their journey. And if you tell a story that somebody remembers, oftentimes that's more important than a lesson that they forget. I think it's always more important. So to your point, it's different audiences require different delivery and it's going to be like that forever. We speak in schools. It's hard because I have to think like, okay, what do you, what do you even want to know? You might not even want to hear what I say. So I have to connect with you on another level, most likely. And it's just, it's very humbling. Well, and you have to understand their, their surroundings, what they're familiar with. The ages have something to do with it as well. Cause you always have to, I call it, you know, starting your story where the audience lives, right? You got to make sure that they're before they'll come along on a journey, they're not going to cross that chasm between you and there if they don't feel like you're going to try to meet them and carry them, you know, they're safe. It's, it's a, it's a good story, but you're right. You're always going to have some extreme. It was too deep. It wasn't deep enough. Then you, by then you sort of know you hit the right note. If you're sort of getting, you know, you're getting something from both ends. Yeah. And it's, again, you talk to a hundred people, if 51 of them like you, you're doing pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> it just, it just is the way it is. And yeah. I think that one thing that I've learned when it comes to speaking is I originally wanted to solve everybody's, everybody's everything. So I wanted them to leave and say, awesome. I know exactly what I'm going to do with my life for the next 50 years. And I transitioned that from it, the only thing that I want them to take away is one new understanding, one new belief, one new breakthrough, one piece of courage that they can bring back to their quote unquote normal life. It's just one new action. I just want them to take one new action, whether it's in our business or in their own personal life, whatever it is. And that was a very important understanding for me. Podcast episodes are the same too. Yeah. And, and it, it, you, you can't boil the ocean with just so much, so much, so much information. You know, it's, you've got to, again, the one thing people can remember that can take action on it. Uh, and what keeps the engagement going, you just don't want to show everything at once. You know, I, w I was looking at, uh, you, you, you overlooked one part of your, on your profile. You talked about hitting rock bottom before you sort of came into this. You know, you said you knew what you didn't want to do. What, what, what was all that? What was that about? And I was looking at your profile and I'll just do my, my stalking to know where you're at. <laughs> I, I had a beautiful life from the outside looking in. You'd think my life was amazing. My girlfriend was a model. I was in the best shape ever. I just done a fitness show, sports car, all of the things, everything that anybody could, could think they wanted. And my girlfriend wanted to go across the country and chase her dream. She wanted to move to California and we lived in New Hampshire and I am positive self-improvement Kev. Now I wasn't back then. I was, I was insecure, scared Kev. I yeah. told her, no, Yeah. I said, you should not go to California. Here's a list of reasons why. And she didn't like the list. So she ended up leaving me and best thing she could have ever done. Um, her and I are on great terms. She did the right thing. But when she left me, Doug, I had to look in the mirror and I didn't really like who I was. I was insecure. I lacked confidence. I was afraid of my own shadow. That's what initially got me into self-improvement. And the thing that I leaned on the most, I started doing positive affirmations. And I said, I'm handsome, I'm worthy, I'm talented, I am intelligent, and this year I'm going to make the most money I've ever made in my entire life. I thought money would fix my problems. In the next year, I got uh, promoted to a foreman at the company I was working for, and we did a lot of traveling. So I lived in New Hampshire. I spent most of my time in New Jersey, which was a seven hour ride for oh, me, depending yeah. on where we were. Yeah. And you get to the end of that next year. And I had been on the road for 10 out of the 12 months. Every single week I was living in crusty hotels. I was making a lot of money, but I was routinely staying up for days on end because that's just what it took. And I didn't really care because I liked the money, but I get to the end of that year. I'm standing at my kitchen table. My girlfriend took the chairs. My ex-girlfriend took the chairs because they were hers. <laughs> and I was never home, so I didn't bother getting new ones. 
I slide open that final pay stub and I made $100,000 at 26 with no college degree, but nothing changed. It was the same thing as before. And shortly thereafter, I started the podcast. The Hyperconscious Podcast was the name. And that passion project soon became something that I knew I wanted to do forever. And I was just, there was more resistance. I kept, I was showing up to work late. I was leaving early. I was calling out. I would sleep in my bed from 10 at night until one in the morning. I'd wake up and drive six hours, seven hours to the job site. I'd work an eight hour a day and then I'd go to the gym. And that was just brutal. Yeah, yeah. And it just, it kept getting worse and it kept getting worse. And my rock bottom basement moment, I, my alarm went off 515 in the morning, crusty hotel in New Jersey, nothing against any of you people in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> But I wake up, I slide to the edge of the bed, I'm lacing up my work boots, and I had done this a thousand times. And the best way to explain it is there's a there's 10 televisions on in my head at the same time, and every single one is on a different channel. It's just noisy. Yeah. One saying you're stuck here, another one saying you can't leave here and make a hundred dollars an hour anywhere else. It's not yeah. gonna happen. Yeah. What will your friends think? What will your family think? And the loudest one that I think resonates probably with most people is do you really think you could be a successful podcaster? And I didn't, I didn't think I could be a successful podcaster. And in that moment, I genuinely felt like if I took my life, I would take my problems with me. And I don't want anybody to ever get to that place. That is a dark, hopeless, helpless place. I texted my business partner, who was just a friend at the time. I said, Hey, Alan, I'm going through it. He was my mentor. He's been my mentor since the beginning. I said, I don't know what to do. And he said, Kev, so much of you has changed over the last few years, but your environment has it. I think it's time for a change. And a few months later, I left my job and proceeded to be broke for the next you know, three years chasing this entrepreneurial dream. But I was more fulfilled and more aligned when I was broke than I ever was when I was quote unquote wealthy. And now we're doing better than I was ever doing before. And we have this business. And But it all started with me going all the way to heck no. When you when you swing all the way to heck no, you're more likely to swing for the fences. And that's what we're doing now. Yeah, you, you have... and, and- yeah, it's unfortunate that you have to get to that that point. And I think, you know, I look back at some jobs where there's times where I just, I look back now and I can see that, yeah, I was I was not doing as well as I could because I just, you know, like I said, calling in sick or whatever it did. I just, it just, it didn't feel right. You were in the wrong place, had the wrong shoes on or whatever you had. So, but it sounds like the podcast was also some cathartic for you as you were going through that. Yeah, I did an episode. Episode number seven was called Chase Your Effing Dreams. And it mm-hmm. wasn't effing in the, in the title. <laughs> it was the Joe Rogan and, style. I get it. <laughs> right, right. And I remember sitting down and it's so interesting because you can kind of see me hating my job more and more as mm-hmm. I did podcast episodes. Yeah. And in that episode, I said that my dream life, my goal, what I wanted out of my future was to wake up when I want, podcast when I want go to the gym when I want, spend time with awesome people and just be my own boss. And here we are. And that's, that's my reality. Now it was, it was where I could actually be myself because nobody, number one, nobody was listening. That's, I think that's the, that's the early part of everybody's journey. And number two, I was turning over a new leaf and becoming a a different version of myself. And on the microphone, I could be that, I could be that version of me. I could be the hyper-conscious version of Kevin who, I deep down wanted it to be anyway. So it, it helped me be me. It helped me be authentic more so than quote unquote real life did. Yeah. It's, it's that I'll, we're pretty good about fooling other people, even though the TVs are going off in our head, telling us, you know, that, that I call them, that's the inner bully. I didn't, yours has TVs. Mine just yells at me and, and you know, tells me <laughs> I suck, but um, you just, <laughs> you have to sort of realize what that is, hear the voice. And then, I question it now. That's sort of the way that I get around it. And I says, well, why is that true? Where's your proof? And, and if you start doing things like that, you'll you'll eventually sort of realize, okay, well, maybe this isn't true. It, it, it is a journey. You don't flip a switch. Anybody tells you that they flip a switch is, well, you know, they're full of crap. But um, it is a journey. But you have to make that one, that one step. It's one step at a time, like you talked to the steps out of the basement. Who's your ideal guest that comes on? I'll be very honest. We've struggled lately with getting aligned guests because I think the self-improvement industry has become kind of, I don't want to say fake, but 
but it's very a lot of people behind the scenes are not what they claim to be yeah <laughs> yeah and <laughs> we've just seen it so often so our ideal guest is somebody who is an industry expert but also humble also heart driven and somebody who is mission oriented and i think that's just becoming more and more rare and it's also somebody who wants to maximize their potential to some degree i mean it's hard to have experts on who don't show they don't have the results of the expertise that they talk about that's a very hard thing for for us to to sit through it's i see so many people that advertise podcasting podcast coaching and production and they have like 30 episodes yeah it's like i don't i don't that doesn't <laughs> resonate i don't understand how that works so yeah. i think we're trying to avoid that when it comes to guests too and it's a challenge it's a challenge to find people that that align with that and you don't know it's going to align or not until after you do the interview usually i mean no matter what you do it always the interview is always a little bit different than everything you see online so it's it's kind of a risk but we're trying to figure that out we're trying to figure that out now more than ever the, it, it's unfortunate that that happens, but it's the nature of any industry that sort of booms. You get these others that claim to do all these other things, and, and they're, it's unfortunately, they don't. And finding, you can find those connections, though. And, and I look at it when I find, find those people, much like the converse, I'm getting a good vibe from the conversation that we're having here is that it's worth the search. To, to, to get those people that do that. It's, it, if you go back to, it's worth kissing a lot of toads to find a, to find a prince or what, what have you. But it, it's, it's some of the journey. Again, I think it's something like you, you know who you don't want to be, you know who you don't want to be like, and you can sort of see things a little clearer than when you, when they actually get somebody, then that re recharges me. Yeah. And the, the higher you climb up the tree, the more you realize whether or not you want to keep going in the direction you're going. We might get to the point where we don't do any guests unless they're high level, you know, quote unquote, A-list. I don't, I don't really know. I think we started doing one episode a week, which was a solo. And then we were doing one episode, which was a guest and a solo. And now it's six solos and a guest. And maybe it'll get to the point where we do seven solos. And if we have a special guest that we really want to bring on, who we really believe in, maybe we'll do a special guest episode. But I think you know, just like anything else, you can be guilty of just doing what you've always done because you've always done it. And I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that and get lost in just, this is what normal is for us. So how's preparing a, for a solo or monologue episode different than one where you're interviewing a guest from a preparation That's a great standpoint? Question. So I'm lucky because I have a co-host, right? So it's, it's still, it's different yeah. yet, but going for a guest, I go through I try to do at least one-to-one. -one. So if it's a half hour interview, I try to do at least a half hour of research. It used to be two to three hours per half hour. But you know, when you get into it, you can kind of do a little better job of understanding where the conversation is going to go. I just creep on them. Like you said, I, I stalk them a little bit. <laughs> I look at their platforms of choice that they use the most. Yeah. I look at their through line of what they're talking about, what's the story. And I always try to find something that they don't talk about often but I know will be powerful. It's always my goal. I always say that I don't really want to learn anything. I don't have people on so I can learn because it's my job to help the audience learn. So I, I tend not to ask many selfish questions. It's very much like, okay, what does the audience need from this guest? So that's how I prep for the guests. And then the solos is pretty simple. Alan and I both come in with a hook, a story, a lesson, a future pace, and a challenge or action and then a call to call to action at the end that's how we do every single one of our episodes pretty much just so we can practice our storytelling and get better at that well with the craziness in the world today there's no shortage of things to get a hook to sort of spin off a story off of. i know i know and once you start thinking like that i try to get people to sort of think in a story when you don't accept something for face value what's the story behind it or how can you use that as is a is a um a mess a um transport for a story or you know some uh, the the hook of a story so it sounds like you've got you know with 900 when's when's the 1000 supposed to hit oh man i think we have <laughs> 942 today so 58 days from today whenever that is sometime just early so that's a good summer present uh, june, i'm not yeah, gonna june we'll, I'm not gonna try we'll have to a do little math. party we'll have a little cake and then we'll <laughs> then we'll record 1001 1001 and the, the show goes on well, well kevin Forever. how can people get a hold of you and what's your pot you know what's your podcast i'm sure it's everywhere 
Um, but yes. you know, and get a hold of you for some coaching if you really want to to do that. How do you do that? Yeah, absolutely. So just search Next Level University. Uh, as Doug mentioned, we're on all the podcast platforms. All of our episodes are on YouTube as well. And then the best place to reach me is Instagram at Never Quit Kid, or you can just shoot me an email, Kevin at nextleveluniverse.com. I like that. Never quit kid. I like that. That's the That's thing. Me. I is, got a is... tattoo, Doug, so I don't forget. All right. Well, <laughs> I, my tattoos are on my my calves and are for these Iron Man. You see the the posters are behind me, that couple Iron Man triathlons, which means I like to suffer and I don't quit. That was well, the thing I learned in one of them is I was, man, I was, I was halfway through the bike ride and it was a hundred and odd degrees outside. It was the hottest Iron Man they had had. It was in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I'm going up this hill. I couldn't eat because the food I'd prepared was good at 70 degrees, but you couldn't eat it at, at 80 or, or 90 degrees. And I'm about to pass out climbing the hill. And the aid worker, you know, says, Hey, how you feeling? He says, well, I don't feel so good. He says, that's strange. You don't look so good either. Here, sit down. So he sat me in a chair, gave me a frozen banana with all the potassium and stuff on that. And I had that discussion with myself. You know, you have one side, hey, you're an old fat dude. You shouldn't have made it this far, but you can be proud of yourself. Just quit now. And the other part, I couldn't live with myself if I did that. You know, I, I, I've, I've not finished one race, and that's because I had to go to the emergency room get stitches. But even then, I tried to think about finishing <laughs> <laughs> but I, that's an important thing is just never quit. Always adjust, go on, um, you know, mistakes in this, you know, like doing this aren't fatal. Usually you, nobody's th throwing you off a stage. And I talk about people in, in presentation. I did a Ted talk. Nobody's going to throw, you know, throw you off the stage. Nobody's going to do this. The worst thing you can do is get up there and know you can do better the next time. So 100%, again, never 100%, give up. I love kid. it. I like that. So thanks a lot, Kevin. Have a, and we're recording this on Good Friday. So have a happy Easter, find some eggs, um, and we'll talk to you later. Likewise, my friend. Thanks for having me, Doug. Thanks. Bye.